vaccinations. But these days, you can't talk about pretty much anything without talking about this. Uh, well, that actually turns out to be relevant. What we have here is the current president's record of false and misleading claims, which at the moment run at around eight or nine per day, so about uh, one every three hours, 24-7, 365 days uh, a year. And he's getting better at it. This is the um, time trend of the number of misleading or false statements uh, made by President Trump uh, since he was inaugurated. Now, this, I think, is one of the reasons why we now have a couple of new words in our uh, vocabulary. Post-truth didn't exist in you know, 2012. No one would have known what that was. In 2016, it was the word of the year, only to be eclipsed a year later by fake news. Now, if you think that's a problem, uh, I've got news for you. It is a little bit of a problem, but to my mind, this one is much bigger. Now, this problem, well, this graph is illustrating what I consider to be a problem. I'm obviously biased here, but so what? Um, these are the presidential approval ratings uh, for Donald Trump on a weekly basis. Uh, I think the last data point over here wasn't that long ago. It was sometime in August, and I can assure you nothing much has changed. Now, you will see that there's one line there that sort of goes down, and there's another one that sort of goes up over time. Uh, what goes down are the disapproval ratings. What goes up are the approval ratings. Now, it's still the case that more people disapprove of Donald Trump than approve, and this is averaged across parties, so you get a com slightly diff well, completely different pattern in terms of the divergence between parties. But nonetheless, the trend is striking. It doesn't seem to matter that Donald Trump is saying things that fact checkers consider to be totally false. In fact, some time ago, about eight or nine months ago, when you ask Americans explicitly whether they think Donald Trump is honest, then what you get is a very interesting pattern. And let me focus on the Republicans, because three quarters of Republicans in this survey think that Donald Trump tells the truth all or most of the time, and only one quarter of Republicans are siding with the overwhelming majority of Democrats in saying that Donald Trump only tells the truth some of the time or less. So that, to me, is a problem worth addressing, and I think it is a broader background against which the concerns that Angus has articulated must be evaluated because we're not just talking about vaccinations here. We're talking about some cultural shift in the epistemic authority of evidence uh, and fact. So what I want to do today, having set the stage, is to touch on these uh, issues. I want to examine whether facts have lost some epistemic authority. I want to tell you whether or not, or examine whether or not fake news matter how they're disseminated, why people would listen to the misinformation, and finally, what we can do about it. Um, so, starting out, do facts matter? Well, my colleagues and I were surprised by how well Donald Trump was doing during the primaries in 2016 at a time when all my liberal American friends considered him to be unelectable. Um, and we thought, hmm, yeah, I wonder about that. And we presented our online participants with uh, some statements by Donald Trump that were either true or false. And we asked them to tell us how, they, how much they believe these statements. So, for example, this is where Donald Trump is particularly relevant to this audience. He once said that vaccines cause autism. Um, we uh, presented that to our participants together with true statements that he also does say, for example, he did say correctly that the U.S. spent $2 trillion on the war in Iraq. Uh, 
we asked our participants for their belief ratings. Having done that, we introduced an intervention by telling them, oh, by the way, that statement here about vaccinations, that was false. And we explained in detail why that statement was false. Um, then we would say, conversely, that the true things were true. We would reinforce these facts saying, well, Donald Trump is correct because we know what the budget office is telling us about the expenditures on the war in Iraq. And we asked our participants again for their belief ratings after this intervention. Now, um, here are the data. And I want you first to focus just on the solid versus dashed lines because they're the ones that differentiate facts in solid lines from misinformation in the dashed lines. And what you can see is that before we did anything, people tended to believe the facts a little more than the myths. Um, but, you know, there was some sort of convergence there. The differentiation wasn't perfect. Now, then we told people the facts are true and the myths are false. And guess what? Everybody who received that intervention believed the facts more and the misinformation less. And that lasted for a week. Now, a week later, there's a little bit of something called forgetting. That means people forget whether this was true or false, so they converge again a little bit. But at first glance, there's amazing differentiation here. People are responsive to corrections that we provided them with. And what's even more interesting is if you now consider the color of the lines, uh, what you find is that this, is, this holds across partisanship. The red lines, dashed or solid, are Trump supporters. Um, the blue lines are Democrats, and the purple lines are Republicans who at the time didn't support Donald Trump. And it didn't seem to matter too much. Uh, there was some effect of partisanship, but not a huge amount. So, so where is the post-truth element in these data? Well, the post-truth element is beginning to show up here. We also asked people whether they would vote for Donald Trump and how they felt about Donald Trump. On the left, you get the voting intentions. On the right, you get the feelings about Donald Trump. And what you can see is that the only thing that matters was whether people supported Donald Trump before they participated in our study. Those people up here will vote for Donald Trump, and they love him. And it doesn't matter what we did with our intervention. Moreover, and this I think is more diagnostic, the degree of belief change after we corrected people's views on the misinformation was not at all associated with their change in voting intention. Now that finding, um, we've replicated at least once, probably twice. Um, we've done all sorts of other things by manipulating the number of true and false statements and, you know, and then some colleagues of ours used a completely different methodology to uh, explore the same idea and it all converges on the same conclusion. Yes, you can correct people's belief about misstatements by Donald Trump, but no, it makes no difference to how they feel about him. It's okay to lie uh, as far as his supporters are concerned. Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to explain why that is, although I think we're beginning to have a very good handle on uh, explaining this sort of loss of epistemic authority of facts. Now, what about fake news? Let's turn to the other side of the equation. Do fake news matter? Now, uh, Anger said earlier that he wasn't until recently, I think, aware of an anti-vaccination movement, thinking that they, these were disorganized individuals. And I think, you know, you're probably correct. However, um, it turns out that whatever was out there, uh, even you know, some uh, 20 years ago, was sufficient to make a big difference to vaccination uptake. Now, this is a study that's now 20 years old, uh, but I'm showing it because 
I find it a very impressive naturalistic experiment because they looked at different countries and identified periods in time when uh, there was a discernible anti-vaccination movement operating uh, in that country alone. Now, this was sort of in the dark ages of the internet, so there probably was very little uh, collaboration between these characters between countries. Uh, but so you can see how in different countries at different times there was opposition to, organized opposition to vaccinations. Now, the solid line in each panel uh, records the incidence of whooping cough, pertussis. And what you can see there is that whenever there is an anti-vaccination movement, uh, the disease goes up. And here in the last graph, we also show vaccine uptake. Uptake goes down. And it's particularly remarkable that this can be completely isolated to one of two neighboring countries that we normally think, think of as being very similar. I mean, to those of us who are not living in the Nordic countries, Sweden and Norway and Denmark are all uniformly happy and equal and have public health and all that. You know, they all seem to be uh, uh, the lucky ones from the outside together. Uh, certainly used to be that way. However, here we have a clear case where Norway and Sweden uh, went apart because the anti-vaccination movement was only uh, limited to Sweden, but somehow never made it across the border into Norway. And incidentally, um, until very recently, whenever you look at anti-vaccination events or trends or movements in the past, I have been struck by how delineated they are to specific countries and, and cultures. And um, uh, well, here's the next example. Uh, from the UK, uh, and this is something you're presumably all familiar with, namely the MMR uh, scandal that erupted in 98. And what I'm plotting here is MMR vaccine uptake over time, uh, and I'm identifying certain key events that uh, went with this uh, publication of that, that infamous paper. And the good news, however, is that I think this graph ends in 2004. By 2012 slash 13, uh, 10 years later, it had been possible to raise uh, vaccine uptake again through considerable expenditure uh, of, of time and money. And remarkably to me, the US was completely spared even though it's also English speaking, uh, that whole thing about MMR and autism um, was largely confined to the UK, at least uh, initially. Now again, this is all the, the boundaries are now blurring, the, the um, internet has become more interactive, more integrated, and with consequences that I will talk about in just a minute. Now here's something that I think is notable and something that we should also consider. And that is that the medical community is not immune generally um, to be misinformed uh, about vaccinations. Now, this is a survey that was done in Wales in 1998 where the belief in a possible association between MMR and autism was actually surprisingly widespread. 13% of GPs, 27% of nurses thought that that was possible. Now, I realized that was, you know, done in 1998, which is precisely when the Wakefield paper was published, and it took a little while for people to recognize uh, how many things were wrong with that. So uh, this might have been a consequence of just the initial publication. Unfortunately, I don't have follow-up data from that, but what I do have is another survey from, in this case, Italian pediatricians um, who were surveyed about their knowledge of mandatory versus recommended vaccinations. Um, and 
it turns out that there was a, to my mind at least, somewhat surprising uh, deficit of knowledge. Now, I should add here, Angus mentioned earlier, that I do a lot of work on climate science and climate change, and I should add that my colleagues and I have published an article suggesting that a lot of climate denial has seeped into the scientific climate science community because of the intense and toxic challenge of the science uh, by outsiders. So in a sense, this doesn't surprise me at all, and it's something maybe that you also want to talk about at some point, um, because very often you also have to preach to the choir first and just make sure you still have a choir before you go out and worry about the public at large. Now, I'm, I'm not saying you know that there's a, a risk, a great risk here, but don't underestimate the efficacy of science denial even on people uh, who should know better because these guys are toxic. So how then are these fake news disseminated? Uh, well, lots of different ways. This is the way it used to be done, uh, and that is um, the media engaging in what I consider to be uh, false balance. There's been quite a bit of examination of that. Here is just one study that did this for uh, the UK media between 98 and 2006. This is all in connection with MMR and um, autism. And what you find is that um, in about a third of all cases, both sides of this issue were being presented in the same way that in climate change in the UK, you invariably get both sides. So here you have a scientist and there you have some guy who's, who's um, you know, an astrologist who has an opinion about climate change and they're given equal weighting. And I'm not making this up. Uh, uh, I've seen a guy on TV who wrote a book about reading the palms of cats. That was his expertise, pronouncing on why climate change is not happening, and he was paired with some professor who spent 30 years studying the problem. Now, uh, what's particularly remarkable is that only 10% of all media articles in the UK during that time presented the one scientific uh, fact that we know about, namely that there is no link between autism and MMR vaccination, and which was established relatively quickly after 1998. So only one-tenth of media articles actually provided the information that we would presumably want the public to have, namely the, the scientific best available knowledge about this issue. Now, it's not surprising then that this false balance um, decreases people's certainty about uh, vaccinations. It creates the impression of a divided opinion. Even a single dissenting voice is sufficient for people to forget that 98% of all scientists agree on this or whatever the number is, even if you give people that number, 98 or 99%, a single dissenting voice uh, has a discernible effect. And sure enough, the UK public, uh, you know, more than half of them in 2002, uh, either believed there was an MMR autism link or that there was equal evidence on both sides. Now, that's sort of bad, but it's actually the good news because the media, at least, um, are at least potentially, gosh, I don't know what's the best, way, best word to use. Maybe controllable is too strong, but at least the media have gatekeepers. They have editors. They may be poor editors. They may have an agenda, but there are editors and shareholders and people who advertise in the media and all sorts of ways in which they, their control or influence can be exercised. Well, that doesn't apply to the internet, of course. And um, just to illustrate, this is again something you may be familiar with, if you search for terms such as vaccination, then uh, in America at least, panel on the right here, 
about three quarters of everything that shows up in Google is anti-vaccination. Uh, in Canada, it's different. Yet again, a, a delineation between two different countries that share a border and are very similar. Well, no, I take that back. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that. I spent 10 years in Toronto. No, well, they're not similar. So anyway, um, three quarters of information in, on Google uh, is anti-vaccination. And if you look at what these anti-vaccination uh, sites are on about, and you're looking through, you know, you're sort of classifying the content by uh, some classification of the strategies by which they're trying to oppose um, vaccinations, then a couple of things jump out. And the one I want to focus on, because I have been involved in doing some work on this, is this notion of conspiracies and the search for the truth. In fact, um, I would like to claim that you're not going to find an anti-vaxxer who isn't also a believer in some conspiracy theory or other, and probably uh, two or three dozen of such uh, conspiracy theories. That's certainly been my experience. But one of the wonderful things about believing in a conspiracy is to the person who's believing it, that they think they're searching for the truth, and therefore it may not come as a surprise that in a paper published just a few weeks or months ago, in a very large sample of Americans, uh, more than a third of respondents indicated that they knew more than doctors and scientists about the causes of autism. Now, that may be really good news from a public education perspective, if that were true. However, a further aspect of the study is that they asked these people a simple quiz about autism. And it turns out that the, the, the folks who thought they knew more than the doctors were the ones who knew the least uh, about autism, an actual fact. So... Um, and that is indeed a very challenging landscape against which to communicate because you're talking to people who think they know and know nothing. Sound familiar? It's like we seem to have that current culture that has bred this sort of uh, discrepancy. And finally, again, uh, just by total coincidence, uh, I came up with the same study that Angus also mentioned about uh, Russian Twitter trolls who were tweeting about vaccinations. Now, here's something that uh, is very interesting and very characteristic of Russian efforts to intervene in public discourse in the West, and that is that the Russian trolls are um, tweeting on both sides of the issue. They're not all anti-vax. They're also pro-vax. They're tweeting on both sides of the issue. And this is similar in style to what happened during the American election in 2016 when fake Facebook accounts that we now know were run by Russians were inviting people to a pro-Trump and a pro-Clinton demonstration somewhere in Texas at the same time in the same place. And the idea was... Let's get them all out there and fight each other. And I think this uh, strategy of seeding discord and um, disrupting a consensus is very powerful. And the more I look at what is going on out there, the more convinced I am um, that, that this is happening on a very large scale. This isn't a conspiracy theory, I don't think. Um, and it remains to be seen what the Mueller probe in the U.S. will uncover. All right, so we have the bad media, we have the bad internet, uh, and now we need to know who's actually listening to this stuff. Who is receptive to that sort of misinformation? And this is, again, something that we need to understand before I can tell you what we can do about 
all these problems. Um, because the messages that we will use to counter anti-vaccine propaganda depend, or must depend, should depend on our target audience, and in particular, their worldview or ideology. Now, I'm using worldview or ideology as, a, as a, just a shortcut to refer to people's fundamental beliefs about how they think the world should be organized. And whichever label you use, ultimately, sooner or later, you always end up with people that are sort of on the left of politics and people that are sort of on the right of politics. It's a lot more nuanced than that, but as a first approximation, left, right, or Republican, Democrat, or whatever, uh, works uh, extremely well. And now here is this um, anecdote that was published by a journalist I absolutely admire and know very well, Chris Mooney, who in 2011 claimed that anti-vax sentiments were focused on the political left. So I thought, really, let's find out. And it seemed very plausible. And so I now want to report three studies that I've done on vaccination attitudes over the years. The first one is published. The other two are fairly new and as yet not out. And um, I would ask people about vaccinations, five items, uh, a huge sample, I mean large enough, more than a thousand usually, surveyed over a number of years, and to predict attitudes of vaccinations, I looked at a number of uh, constructs that differed between the studies, but all of which had something to do uh, with people's worldviews or political attitudes. And then I analyzed it using structural equation models. And just, just to make sure, I don't know, I mean, you know, there's probably a diverse range of expertise in this room, but just if you're not a multivariate statistician, and I suspect some of you aren't, let me just tell you what a structural equation model is. It's a fancy way of doing something that you might also understand to be factor analysis, where what you do is you have your individual items on the questionnaire, and from those items on the questionnaire, you're extracting a construct or a factor, a latent variable, that is free of measurement error and that uh, gives you the best estimate of the association between the constructs that you're interested in. And just so you understand the data that are forthcoming on the next few slides, um, what I'm doing to facilitate presentation is I'm getting rid of the original items because it just it's way too cluttered if I put all, up, all of those up there. But every bubble you will see from here on is a latent variable. That is, it is the construct that I'm estimating from a number of items and you can take for granted in all cases that these estimates have decent psychometric properties and are, as far as, as best I can tell, uh, good measurement models. So here then is the first uh, stab at trying to predict vaccination attitudes from uh, a number of potential constructs. And in this study, I also looked at climate change and genetically modified foods. Now, the first overwhelmingly strong predictor for vaccination hesitancy is belief in conspiracy theories. So in this study, I would ask people something like this. Princess Diana's death was not an accident, but an assassination by the British royal family. And the more people would endorse this, or about a dozen other statements like that, you can guess, you know, uh, the CIA killed Kennedy or Martin Luther King, et cetera, et cetera. The, you know, this popular conspiracy theories, the more people endorse those, the less likely they were to think that vaccinations were good for you. And that correlation, minus 0.54, in, in the social sciences is actually, that's big. Okay, that's a quarter of the variance in attitudes that you can explain on the basis of um, Princess Diana's death and what people think about that. Now, 
uh, interestingly, there was also a further negative correlation between free market endorsement and vaccinations, which actually runs counter to this mythology that um, vaccination hesitancy is focused on the political left. Well, in my studies, I have yet to find that, um, although it's a bit more nuanced than that. So here we have people whom I would call libertarians or free market fundamentalists, just to have a label, you know, a catchy label for people who think that the free market is the best way to distribute goods in a society. The more you endorse that, uh, the less you like vaccinations. Um, however, interestingly, conservatism, social conservatism, as distinct from libertarianism, does go the other way. So it looks at first glance as though, in fact, this idea that um, people on the left are less likely to endorse vaccinations has some truth in it, because, of course, a positive correlation between conservatism and vaccinations would be a negative correlation if I just called this liberalism or progressivism. I mean, it's a symmetrical construct. I could just flip it around. And that's very intriguing because conservatism and libertarianism are highly correlated, and you rarely get this dissociation between the two. Until Brexit, that is. <laughs> and then everything has become completely pointing in different directions. Um, but on its own, conservatism is not predictive. If you take out the free market construct, there's nothing left that conservatism can explain. So it's not a huge effect, whatever is there. But what is there is free market attitudes which do uh, survive taking out conservatism. Here's the next study. It was so much fun, we do it again. And we find the same thing. Negative correlation between free market endorsement and vaccinations. And in this case, we asked people a variety of other uh, questions uh, for reasons that are unrelated to vaccination. These were done for theoretical reasons. And we picked up a negative correlation, this time with religiosity. So people who are highly religious were less likely to be looking at uh, vaccinations favorably. And finally, here we have the last study. Um, where, guess what? We again find a negative correlation between free market endorsement and vaccinations. Minus 0.23, it's always roughly the same magnitude. You know, about five to 10% of the variance is explained by people's free market attitudes. And uh, in case you're wondering why that is, I suspect it has lots to do with the libertarian insistence that the government shouldn't tell them to keep their kids alive, okay? I mean, if you're a parent, then you ought to be able to make decisions about um, what your child, what risks your child is exposed to. And yet again in this, we put in conservatism, and yet again we had a positive relationship with that. Yet again, on its own, that wasn't predictive. So what really matters is attitudes towards the free market or conservatism you know, economic conservatism, if you want to call it that, whereas social conservatism is kind of hanging on to the free marketeers, but it doesn't on its own have a uh, reliable effect. What's left? Well, here's an interesting one that probably comes as no surprise. People who endorse complementary and alternative medicine uh, just don't like vaccinations, and that correlation is, again, uh, massive. And it meshes extremely well with data, this time from Switzerland, that um, the refusal or hesitant uh, refusal of vaccinations is far higher among users of complementary medicine than it is uh, in a baseline comparison group. So um, this correlation, again, I think from a communication point of view is worth knowing about. Uh, and it'll be interesting to work out ways in which one can cope with that. So, what are we up to? Well, we can draw some conclusions here. I think, inter, you know, inter, uh, interim con conclusion. Um, and the first one is that uh, 
conspiratorial thinking is always present, strongly associated with vaccination rejection, and so is libertarianism. And here is a cross-country uh, comparison of the conspiracism variable, I think it is, which shows that that holds uh, wherever you go. So um, that is something we have to deal with. So why does that matter? Why is, why is it so important to understand worldviews? Why am I going on about it? Well, I'm going on about it because um, people's worldviews not only affect their attitudes towards vaccination, but then also how they respond to corrective information. And let me now show you uh, some data that support this. Um, one of the problems is that if you're presenting people with messages that are incongruent with their worldviews, they may often counter-argue and become more entrenched in their beliefs, uh, more so than if you had said nothing. And of course, as a communicator, that's precisely the opposite of what you want to achieve. Here are some data from Brendan Nyhan and colleagues from four years ago, where um, what they did was to differentiate their participants on the basis of prior attitudes towards vaccination. And the panel on the left, which is the one that's really interesting, that's the panel of people who were least favorable about vaccinations before the experimental investigation. These were just the people who were kind of like, well, hesitant to begin with, didn't like vaccinations much. And then they were asked whether they would give MMR to another child either without any intervention in the control condition, and what you find is that you know, it's only about 60 to 70 percent of people, which is still pretty high, by the way, but it's only 60 to 70 percent who were willing to do that again. Now, those people in that group who were told that MMR actually does not cause autism and who were disabused of this mistaken belief that there was a risk for their child, uh, their intention to vaccinate actually declined significantly. There was a backfire effect. By telling people there's nothing to worry about, they became more entrenched in their belief. And this isn't an isolated result. Uh, Cornelia and, co and, and, and her colleague have reported related results that depending on the source, depending on the circumstances, an extreme risk negation can actually enhance people's perceived risk. So if you're making it sound too safe, then that may actually not be uh, in your favor. So that's why worldviews matter. Now another problem we're having is conspiracies, which I showed was one of the major factors underlying rejection of vaccinations, Conspiracies um, are self-sealing. That's, in fact, by definition, that of a conspiracy theorist. I, I've written a number of papers on this. Um, and, and to my mind, the, 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 the clearest evidence that somebody is a conspiracy theorist rather than a person who thinks there is a conspiracy, totally different things, uh, is the self-sealing uh, nature of the epistemology in which contrary information against the conspiracy is reinterpreted as confirmation by simply saying, oh, okay, well, if that judge said X, Y, Z, whatever, didn't do anything wrong, all that means is that the judge is on the take, okay? That is self-sealing because contrary evidence is flipped around as evidence for the conspiracy. Uh, now, we also know from lots of research that it's very difficult to correct uh, conspiracy theories. And just to uh, reinforce that, here's a recent study by um, uh, colleagues of mine, including Karen Douglas um, at Kent, who showed that if you expose people to a conspiracy theory about vaccinations, then 
people's intention to vaccinate go down compared to a control condition that got no such information. So maybe that's not so surprising. But now look here. They also had a condition where they presented that conspiracy theory followed by a correction where people were told, well, actually, that conspiracy theory is wrong. And these were just, you know, these weren't committed conspiracy theorists. These were people who were just exposed to a conspiracy theory in the laboratory. And once they've been exposed, telling them that was all nonsense does not uh, eliminate the effect of the conspiracy theory. That number down here, the intention to vaccinate, is lower than in the control condition and does not differ, if I remember correctly, from the conspiracy-only condition. So the mere exposure to a conspiracy, th conspiracy theory is sufficient to decrease people's intentions to vaccinate and telling them the conspiracy was nonsense doesn't seem to make a difference. So finally, what can we do about this? And that was all sort of bad news, more or less. What can we do about it? Well, it turns out there, there is stuff we can do. You know, we're not entirely powerless here, but we do have to understand where the problem comes from and what it is before we can respond to that. And in case you haven't read it yet, let me just draw your attention to a recent massive article that uh, uh, covers all of the tools in far more detail than I can do in the remaining uh, 10 minutes or so. Well, let's talk about worldviews again. Worldviews are crucial. That's why I went on about under explaining what drives people's vaccination attitudes. So how do we deal with the worldview? Well, Matt Hornsey is using the, the term jujitsu, which I think is terrific because it means you're using the opponent's momentum to twist them around and change their mind based on what it is they are rather than trying to make them believe something different. And here's an experiment by Dan Cahan and colleagues uh, that is illustrating that. Dan Cahan has this sort of, these four quadrants of different types of people. Now, I'm going to focus on this guy up here and that fellow down there. And just read what, uh, these are totally fictitious characters, by the way. These are faces just off Google from somewhere. <laughs> and they were then paired with imaginary titles of books these people have written. This guy, for example, wrote a book, allegedly, called The Immigrant Invasion Threatening the American Way of Life, The War on American Manhood. <laughs> and down here we have this guy, Three Social evil Evils, Sexism, Racism, and Homophobia. I mean, you know, you just get the picture, right? You know exactly what that guy is on the top left, and down here you can just smell the tofu, and you can imagine the, you can imagine the Birkenstocks, and, I mean, you know, you, you just know these guys. Okay, except they don't exist, but never mind that. So why is this important? Well, in this study uh, by Cahan et al., uh, they classified their participants into being one of these guys on the top left, you know, the, the free marketeers versus the hippies, just so we have, you know, short labels, let's call them that. And then the messengers were either hippies, as shown in the previous picture, or these free market uh, uh, fundamentalist hardcore conservatives. And there were three conditions. And the conditions were either that the messages were unattributed, so the participants didn't know who was saying, who was saying them, or the messenger was aligned as expected. So that meant that the um, free marketeer would argue against HPV vaccination for young girls. Well, of course they would because HPV is sexually transmitted and we do not want our young daughters to be enticed to do the wrong thing just because they're vaccinated, right? So, uh, hence the opposition. The hippies, on the other hand, um, you would expect to say, yeah, sure, I want my daughter to be protected. So you, you, you had this cultural alignment between messengers, either as expected or violating it. 
violating it means the conservative guy was re recommending HPV vaccinations and the hippie was saying, no, don't do it. Now look at what happens in these three conditions. And the measure here is polarization. That is the difference between the hippies and the free marketeers in the subject population. If you don't attribute the sources, but people hear a message that's pro-vaccine and then anti-vaccine, you get considerable polarization. I mean, the scale's only out of three, so 0.57 is quite a bit of polarization. Now, if you align the messages as expected, so the free marketeer says don't vaccinate, the hippie says do vaccinate, the polarization goes up. And now it's quite substantial, 0.83 on a three-point scale. And now what happens when the alignment violates expectation? The polarization almost disappears. Why? Because now each tribe has their own messenger whom they believe who is telling them something that is opposing their prejudices, therefore bringing them closer together. What's the bottom line? The bottom line is the messenger matters a great deal. Do not send me to Texas to talk to conservatives. It's just absolutely no point. They can sniff me out from, you know, two miles upwind. You gotta have a guy who is conservative to go and talk to people in Texas and vice versa. Uh, so, that is um, my first installment of jujitsu persuasion, which is to get the messenger right. The second one is, uh, to take that further, not with um, messengers, but messages. So, for example, in the case of climate skepticism or anti-vaccination attitudes, what we need to do is we need to identify the deep attitudes that people hold and why they hold them. Why do people hate climate science so much? Well, I can tell you right now, it's because they're free marketeers, because if I know what people's attitudes are towards the free market, I know what they think about the laws of physics. The correlation is immense. So once you know that, you can then design messages that bypass these deep attitudes by engaging more on the surface. For example, in the case of climate change, you can talk about the health benefits of cutting emissions, the cost savings of solar panels. Whatever you do, don't mention climate. Likewise, with anti-vaccination attitudes, you gotta design messages that can bypass these deep uh, attitudes. And I want to conclude by putting up, I think I've got two more slides, uh, what I consider to be a particularly promising avenue for all of this, known as inoculation. Now I want to take you back to the study I talked about five or ten minutes ago when I said conspiracy theories are so terrible and they have effects that we can't overcome. Here are the data again, and there they are. If you tell people about a conspiracy, then the opposite, and oops, you're still down in the basement in terms of intention to vaccinate. What I didn't tell you was that that study had another condition. It had another condition in which all that was done was to reverse the order of the messages. So people were told first that, hey, there are conspiracies out there. They're nonsense. Don't believe them. Then they were shown the conspiracy. And that, have a look, did not significantly depress intention to vaccinate. So by simply inoculating people ahead of time, beware you will be exposed to a conspiracy theory, you have defanged that conspiracy theory. So in Brazil with yellow fever, uh, the moment you know there's stuff coming out in social media, you just gotta take that message and Go out there and say it first and tell people, by the way, there are some clowns out there on the internet who are sending around a fake video that is trying to confuse you or whatever it takes. You have to design the message carefully. You have to test it empirically. But nonetheless, you get there first, warn people about what's coming, and there's 
bucket loads of evidence now. Wow, maybe that's an exaggeration. But this consistent evidence and enough for me to be fairly confident that inoculation works. It also works generically. I ran a study just over the summer um, where we trained in a three-minute video, we trained people to recognize the incoherence of arguments that characterize denial. One of the interesting things about climate denial and also vaccination denial is that the arguments are cognitively flawed. Well, they have to be because they're not scientific. So they end up being incoherent. And if you're incoherent, you can't be right. It's as simple as that. No scientific fact or theory is incoherent. Um, so we teach people that in three minutes. And we then get them to practice on picking up incoherent statements from anti-vaccine or anti-climate science messages. And guess what? This boosts support for vaccinations. Slightly, it's a small effect, but significantly so. And it does it for uh, vaccinations as well as for climate science. So training people to recognize they're being misled by incoherence does make a difference to their susceptibility to misinformation. And that brings me to the end. We do have a problem. I think there's evidence to suggest that organized opposition has adverse consequences for public health. We also can say, at least in the United States, that hesitancy is greater on the political right overall than on the left. Now, that's in America. My data are from America. We must be careful not to overextend it to other societies without further empirical test. Uh, Anti-vaccination is driven by conspiracy theories. They're very difficult to deal with unless you tell people ahead of time that there is a problem. And whatever you do, make sure that the messenger and the message aligns with the worldview of your audience. And thank you very much for your attention. I'll leave it at that.